So at the beginning of Lent, I really was struggling to think of a sermon theme or a series to preach as we prepare ourselves for Easter, for Good Friday, and for Resurrection. But then as I was reading Psalm 51, which was one of the readings for Ash Wednesday, this verse just stuck out to me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain in me a willing spirit. And I like the way Eugene Peterson, the message, the author of the message uh, translation, writes it. God, make a fresh start in me. Shape a Genesis week from the chaos of my life. Don't throw me out with the trash or fail to breathe holiness in me. Bring me back from grey exile. Put a fresh wind in my sails. So we've been through the first part. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And now we continue with the second part. The part that has to do with sustaining. Sustain me. At the beginning we spoke about restoration. And on Ash Wednesday we say repent. Turn around. Come and, and, and follow God. Follow Jesus. And it reminded us that repent is not a, a word about um, punishing yourself or making yourself feel miserable. But it's just a way of saying, turn around, change your mind. And so David teaches us to pray to God, restore. It's a way of saying to God, turn me around, I need your help. And so is the image of a restoration mechanic or somebody who's taken an old something that's all beaten up and fixing it up. And that's what we're asking God to do, to restore us. It's a reminder of some of the steps of the 12 steps of the AA movement who say in secular kind of language that they came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. And we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood Him. We're able to present to you here the power of God in the Holy Spirit we're able to present to you here an understanding of God as Jesus Christ, who died on the cross, who identified with our sins and rose again so that he could lift us up in all of our brokenness, understanding all of our brokenness and giving us new life. The second point of, of David's prayer seems unlikely. Restore to me joy. I want joy. But then we hear Jesus, the way he speaks about blessedness, or in the Good News translation, happiness. Happy are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. All of these unlikely words about what it means to be blessed remind us that the kind of joy that God offers us is an eternal and lasting and meaningful kind of joy. Not the joy that you get from a new bicycle, which is, Heather sometimes has to call me in because I sit there looking at my bicycle. It's somebody else's old bicycle, but I do just sit there looking at the big wheels and thinking about where they're going to go. It does make me happy, but that happiness won't last. The joy that lasts is the joy of doing what God requires. It's food that lasts forever. And so we share in God's blessedness, God's flourishing, God's shalom, which he has prepared for us. And we're able to have hope. To have hope, one South American theologian said, is to hear the music of God's future. But to have faith is to dance to it. And so the salvation story is what David plants himself in, saying, I'm working towards God's purpose in the world, and this gives me great joy, and I want the joy of your salvation, O Lord. And then he goes on to speak about what he will be doing with the joy of that salvation. He says, then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. When we read that out of context, we think, oh, I'm going to go and teach those sinners a thing or two. And you know how we are. We go past the pub late at night, and we uh, judge everybody there because we're not there. We judge the people next door who are having a big party and making a lot of noise. They're not here today, are they? No, they're not here just in case they wanted to hear. We judge people and we think those are the sinners, but David's prayer is saying, I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner and I'm going to go and teach others about the mess I've made of my life and I'm going to help them to get out of the mess that they're in. David continues to say that he's going to present an acceptable sacrifice to God 
a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Amadini katiko ngumoya uapuki leo, inklizio e apuki leo, neko boki leo, akui kudela tiko. As we say at the beginning of our 11 o'clock service, when we can have that again in Isiposa. So now he goes on to say, sustain in me a willing spirit. But look at this. We've got two pictures. We've got the picture of a willing spirit in verse 12 and a broken spirit in verse 17. I like this picture and those who can't see it out in the parking lot. It's a picture of somebody who's made a, a sculpture of a hand holding up a bent branch of a tree. It's a reminder that in our brokenness we have the support that we need. And that support, that true support, comes from God. It is only when we are broken that we are able to truly surrender to God's power to lift us up and hold us up and help us to be the people we are created to be. David has lost sight of the fact that in life you need to live in relationship. You need to live in relationship with humans and that's what's been awful about this pandemic is we've been separated from our friends and those who comfort us. But you need relationship with God. One of my favorite parts of scripture is that God paraded the animals before Adam to see what he would name them. And I think Adam must have been Afrikaans because he said, that lakes was a Camille Pert. And things that make sense. Not giraffe, that doesn't make any sense. We are made for companionship, but the greatest companionship that we are created for is the companionship of God. He puts his hand in there to lift us up and sustain us. When you bring your children to be baptized, we ask the congregation and we ask you, will you take care of them in body, mind and soul? And we're very good at looking after our children in body. A sign of a fever and we're off to the emergency room. A sign of, of not eating your vegetables and we're ready to squish them and squash them into mincemeat and pancakes to make them eat them. As far as mind goes, we're always looking for the best school to send our kids to. And I'm amazed that the private schools in, uh, a friend of mine is going to be the chaplain at one of the fancy private schools. And I reckon if you just put that money away every year, you could let them retire at the end of high school and then they could live large for the rest of their lives. But anyways, we look after our body and our mind, but our soul part of our body tends to stay pretty quiet. It doesn't demand like our body which wants food or our mind which wants its curiosity satisfied. Your body has a language that it speaks. It likes chocolate. It likes ice cream. It might even like exercise. It likes hugs. Your, your mind likes gossip about Harry and Meghan. Likes action movies and murder mysteries. And if you're into maths, it likes Sudoku, whatever that is. And as you go along, your soul just seems to go along for the ride. You know, you think, I watched that movie and it fed my soul or it harmed my soul or I ate that chocolate and it nourished my soul. But it doesn't really. We know the language of our bodies and our minds, but we haven't figured out the language of our soul because our soul only makes a noise when it's happy or it makes a noise when it's sad. And then when it's sad, we don't know how to feed it and nourish it. It's quiet and it can be neglected. We feed it with our soap operas as we seek relationship or a sense of belonging. And then there's that old McDonald's clown that promises to feed us when we're hungry, but never truly satisfies our need. It's kind of a scary one, isn't he? I like that one. Body, mind and soul. And I think that's David's problem. He's praying the psalm because his body and his mind got him into trouble. He looked from that rooftop and saw Bathsheba taking a bath. And body and mind took over and soul had become weak and neglected. He thought intimacy with Bathsheba would solve his problem. Like we think that the next big slab of chocolate will solve our problem or the next beer or the next whatever it is. 
But all he was doing was squashing his soul further into a tiny little hole in his heart. But the prophet Nathan helped him to see what had gone wrong. He was able to point out to David, you've gone and broken your soul. You've broken God's heart and your heart. And David is able to say, with the brokenness of my heart, I am able to come to you, O God. And with the brokenness of my heart, I am able to allow you to lift me up. David, knowing how much of a mess he's in, is able to say to God, restore to me. Depending entirely on God's help. Knowing that he can't do it on his own. Knowing that he cannot do it in his own power, but he can only do it with God's help. Lord, sustain me. We've tried too long to do it on our own. We've tried too long to live lives that are meaningful and purposeful without realizing that there is no joy, there is no life without leaning firmly on God. The word sustain in English is just such a deep word, but it's the same in Hebrew. If you lay hands on somebody, then it's to, to, to rest your hand on them. To ask God to sustain you is to ask God to be the one that just holds your hand in place. To hold it. To ask God to sustain you is to say, I can do nothing. I need you to be my foundation, my uplift, my strength. In Psalm 3, verse 4 and 5, it's used so beautifully. I lie down and sleep. I wake again. For the Lord sustains me. I'm not afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. I want that on my, on my bedside table, don't you? I lie down and sleep. I wake again, for the Lord sustains me. Every time you go to sleep, remind yourself that you can do nothing. Nothing but rest. Nothing but sleep while God holds you in life. In Psalm 55, verse 22, cast your burden on the Lord and He will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. Cast your burden on the Lord and He will sustain you reminded of the way that Jesus teaches us to pray. Give us this day our daily bread. God wants to restore you. God wants to give you the joy of living the salvation life, which is not just about that sort of spared from hell to go to heaven, but about living a meaningful life that makes good in the world. God wants to spare you to have rest in Him, to allow Him to hold you. I love the way Peterson puts it. Put a fresh wind in my sails. The thing is, all you really need to do is put the sails up. And so as this week goes by and we fast towards Lent, I want you to think about how you are trimming your sails. God's wind is blowing. God's Spirit is there to give you joy and hope and restoration. But have you neglected the food for your soul? Maybe slow down on your walk or your run or your bike ride and, and notice the little things. Maybe pay attention to how much you're letting negative winds blow you in the wrong direction. But you're not paying attention to the winds that could blow you in a positive direction. Does your sail look like carving out 30 minutes to draw a picture? Does it look like reading a poem over and over again until you understand it? Does it look like reading the scripture 
instead of scrolling through Facebook or YouTube or whatever it is that I often do at night instead of reading the scriptures. Don't let those junk foods blow you around. They'll only give you gas. So we ask God to restore us. And this week, pay attention to how you trim your sails. How are you going to cut out that time to grow yourself in the direction that God wants to grow you? Don't overdo it. Don't think to yourself, I'm going to read the whole Bible on Monday and then all the spiritual classics on Tuesday. Maybe just say to yourself, I'm going to read a verse. Even if it's just a verse-by-verse -verse devotion and I'm going to pray through it. And say to yourself, I'm just going to walk once around the block. I'm not going to chase a time or put my Strava on to see how fast I'm going. But take it easy. Maybe speak to those around you about the time that you need. And it's really hard with kids and jobs and all those things. But find that space to trim your sails. Because if you are filled with joy from God, if you are filled with a sustained and willing spirit, you will be the best version of yourself that you can be. With God's help. Amen.